This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everyone. Um, this morning you have me, and uh, that's owing to two things. One is a gap in the schedule, and two is that I, um, I actually just finished editing a compendium for CERC research on aneurysms, thoracic and abdominal aneurysms, and uh, we actually wrote one of the sections, and Raimundo, who's being a typical great fellow who's actually not here, uh, wrote one of the, helped me write one of those sections on uh, uh, the cellular mechanisms of AAAs and uh, cellular mechanisms of aortic aneurysms. And what sort of struck me as I was pulling this together, and it's, you know, if anybody wants to read it, there's a really good uh, section on genetics, actually, really, really nicely written. Um, but there's sections on genetics, cell mechanisms, microRNAs, uh, surgical and medical therapies. And, um, and uh, you know, as I was putting it together, it sort of struck me that there's a pretty strong disconnect between what we understand about the pathobiology of aneurysms and actually how we treat them. And in reality, we have no specific medical therapy for abdominal or thoracic aortic aneurysms. We have stuff we do, and some of it has some basis and some of it doesn't, and uh, I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. Uh, so I just thought I'd, what I'd do is you today is sort of review some of the data, not all of it obviously, about the mechanisms of aneurysms and then, and then talk about the basis of uh, some of the therapy. So, those are our objectives, the basic types of thoracic and aortic aneurysms. Learn a little about the cellular mechanisms, not too much. No Western blots, no PCR. Actually, there are a couple Western blots in there. But, um, and then talk about our current pharmacologic therapies and, you know, and where we could go from that. You know, what, are the, what are the opportunities there? So, so I think it's really fundamentally, under understand to, uh, under fundamentally important to understand that these are different diseases, right? A, a thoracic and abdominal aortic aneurysm are two fundamentally different diseases, all right? Um, you know, obviously they have different anatomical locations. That's an easy one. We all know that, right? That's easy. But they're really different risk factor profiles. So think about that, right? Think of abdominal aortic aneurysms. Number one, right, is smoking, right? That's the strongest risk factor for pretending risk for uh, AAA, followed by male sex and then family history. Um, and then it goes down from there, whereas, you know, some things like hypertension really, in some studies, don't even fall out as a risk factor for AAA. Whereas in thoracic aneurysms, right, you have a very, as we'll talk about it, there's a syndromic and familial ones and then sporadic ones, but family history is a very strong factor, hypertension very strong, and, and of course, uh, you know, cocaine and things like that, uh, strong precipitants of dissection. <clears throat> the cell biology is fairly different with some overlap. But there's some fundamental differences, and that comes from the histology. If any of you remember back to looking at these when you were in medical school, one of the keynotes of the key features of the, the, of the abdominal aortic aneurysm right, is loss of smooth muscle, right? There's apoptosis, smooth muscle cells go away. Actually, a mature abdominal aortic aneurysm is largely a lot of fibrotic tissue, relatively acellular. And, you know, from a mechanical perspective, you know, the smooth muscle normally sustains the load of your blood vessel wall, but in an abdominal aneurysm, smooth muscle is gone and that load is sustained by the adventitia. Whereas in thoracic uh, aneurysms, aortic aneurysms, smooth muscle is still usually there. It's dysfunctional. Things are dilated. You've lot of, lost a lot of elastin. You have some similar features, but the smooth muscle is there. And then when you get dissections, right, there's a true dissection through that smooth muscle layer. Whereas when an abdominal aortic aneurysm ruptures, it's a flat out tear of the adventitia. So cell biology pretty differently. And as I said, you know, about 20% of the patients with thoracic aortic aneurysms have this autosomal dominant inheritance, inheritance that we know about, but it's essentially zero for AAA, right? There are a few sporadic sort of, and, and maybe not well validated uh, families with AAAs, but really it's not an autosomal dominant inheritance like we see with, with these familial and syndromic uh, thoracic aortic aneurysms. So that's, that's pretty different. And, and, I, and I guess the other thing is there's very little crossover between that too. If you look at the people that have these thoracic aortic aneurysms, especially the ones that have been so carefully genetically uh, quantified, is they really are rarely at risk for an abdominal aortic aneurysm. All right, let's talk about thoracic aneurysms. Everybody should know this, right? The classic uh, 
uh, types of aneurysms and uh, at least the most common uh, description of dissections with type A and type B. Put dissections up because it's such a fundamentally important part of the thoracic aneurysm and it is what we're trying to avoid, right, when we treat these patients. Um, so this should be pretty straightforward and everybody knows that. So genetics of thoracic aneurysms, let's talk about that. We're gonna talk about thoracic aneurysm first. So there's really, I always put them in three bins, right? They're just syndromics, you know, and Marfan being the classic one that we know about. And then these familial non-syndromic, those are a whole bunch of other ones. And we'll talk about some of the basis of that. But, it, but the majority of them are sporadic. So really in about 20% fall into that top group, right? Of, of really having a clear uh, familial and, and uh, and syndromic uh, connection to it. And the rest are sporadic. Um, and, and some have some inheritance and some are, you know, are spontaneous mutations. Now, as we'll talk about, a lot of them are in the same pathways. A lot of them, as you know, involve the TGF beta signaling pathways and related things. But so it is, it is a very heterogeneous group. So we tend to think of them all as the same. And lessons we learned about treating Marfans, we automatically translate to other thoracic aneurysms. And that might not be might not be valid. I always find this picture really interesting and very helpful to think about the genetics of disease. And if you, you think about things that, that, you know, on here is the allele frequency, okay? So over here are very common things. So common things, all right? So things that have very kind, common minor, minor allele frequency often have a very low impact on the phenotype, all right? Whereas things that have a very strong very rare things often are, have much stronger effect. And that sort, of, that sort of applies to almost anything you think about in genetics in human. And, and part of that's because, uh, you know, Dr. Darwin, right? If you have something that's very common that has a strong phenotype, evolution's gonna weed that out over time. And so things sort of exist on this continuum here. And we can think of a lot of the thoracic things are down here, right? These Marfan, et cetera. And then a lot of things related to AAA are more up here. Well, we're not going to be able to say, ah, this gene causes a triple A, but there's going to be some GWAS. There's going to be so, and this is more of a GWAS sort of thing. This is more sort of candidate gene on the uh, on the low frequency stuff, and and so it's a, a very different different story. So these are more family studies. These are more GWAS studies. <clears throat> the one sort of exception to this, excuse me, I'm getting over a cold from my grandchildren. A nice gift from the grandkids. Um, the one exception to this that's sort of an exception to this, really not a minor allele, if it wouldn't use that term, but sex is one thing that plays into this in a very different way. And uh, if you think about it, there's a lot of evolutionary pressure to keep two sexes going, um, but also the effects can, can sort of be uh, uh, um, uh, very broad. So we'll talk about that at the end. All right, so here is a bad picture that somehow slipped when I was making it, sorry about that, of all the genes known to be, I wonder how that happened, I guess I slipped on that, um, known to be involved in thoracic aneurysms. And the bottom line is don't remember any of that. There's just a ton of stuff. But, um, you know, there's a real laundry list, and there's a group of them that are really definitive. And we're going to talk about Marfan in a little bit as sort of the sort of classic one that we know about and use that as, as a sort of a case to go through the cell biology and what, how we've evolved therapy from that. But as you can see, as you look through a lot of these things, these are the, the genes, names, and you know, smooth muscle actin, collagen, fibrillin, <laughs> smooth muscle myosin, you know, TGF beta 2, TGF beta 2 receptor. And you can see some of these are really related to these major syndromes, right? And uh, you know, the smooth muscle dysfunction syndrome, Marfan there, you can see with fibrillin 1, which we'll talk about in detail. Uh, Louise Dietz, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of these are around TGF beta. They've been clearly identified. In most cases, they've actually made, they've identified the gene in people, done some studies in human tissues, and then often made the mouse model that recapitulates the human phenotype. So that's, you know, those, that makes those very, very definitive. What's interesting is they're not all about matrix. Because when you think about the vessel wall and you think, well, the vessel wall gets weak and the vessel starts dilating, you think, well, it's all matrix proteins, right? That's all about collagen and stuff. And, and that, that certainly is true with TGF beta to some degree, although TGF beta has other effects and that's trans transforming growth factor beta. But smooth muscle obviously is something different, right? So why is smooth muscle so important? 
And it turns out a lot of this is related to the interaction between the matrix and the smooth muscle. Because the smooth muscle doesn't sit there in isolation. It sits embedded in a collagen elastin matrix. And so a lot of this really relates to the connectivity of that. Now there's a whole bunch of them where there's sort of <clears throat> some data to suggest that they're involved too. And a lot of these are a little bit further down the signaling pathways. And these are related, uh, like I said, signaling proteins here, you know, notch signaling and things like that. But some are structural program proteins like elastin, um, et cetera. And I only put these up just to give you a sort of a broad view of the types of things. But most of it's around smooth muscle and extracellular matrix. And then there's some, you know, this is the, this is the sort of the complete list of, of things that have been sort of at the top of the list. Uh, the top uh, that have been identified. And uh, so these are ones that are, you know, some association studies but haven't been proven uh, with either um, studies from human tissue and or uh, mouse studies to recapitulate. But again, you can see TGF-beta, which is involved in fibrosis, uh, inflammation, et cetera, but also smooth muscle and structural proteins. So a lot of it around that. So let's talk a little bit about Marfan, and I know you all know this. Um, but that's, that's Dr. Marfan, and, I, and one thing I learned a few months ago about Dr. Marfan is Mar, Dr. Marfan's index patient probably didn't have Marfan, or right? had something else, right? Had a, had a very different disease, had a very similar phenotype, but we now name Marfan syndrome after him, uh, but in fact, he probably never saw a patient with Marfan syndrome. Um, but first described in 80, 1896, one in 10,000 births, about 25% spontaneous, so not all inherited, right? And uh, the vast majority related to mutations in the fibrillin-1 gene, all right? But there's been, like you can see there, over 2,000 different mutations described. And that's really interesting when you think about it. So it's not like sickle cell, right, where you have a single amino acid flip and you suddenly have a phenotype and it's conserved and that's the only thing you see. What you have is all these different mutations and they cause slightly different diseases. And that's going to complicate it as we think about therapy. Because not all of it is in an active site for binding. Some of them are, are, um, <clears throat> are missense mutations, right? And, but some probably cause some changes in folding. Some cause some changes in binding to the receptor. And some, you know, a bunch of other things. So, so it's a heterogeneous, even though it's identified to this one gene, it's really a heterogeneous disease. And I think that's going to be important. <clears throat> so as I said, caused by mutations in this FIB1 gene, fibrillin 1 gene. So it's an extracellular matrix glycoprotein. That sounds exciting, right? And of course, when that was first identified, everybody thought, aha, well, and it was first identified really in about four or five patients. <clears throat> and, you know, everybody thought, well, this is probably a direct link to mechanical, right? You've got a, an extracellular matrix protein, you're sort of losing your rebar or your structure of the vessel wall. But really the mutation is probably not a direct link to this mechanical function. And the sort of going hypothesis, which is we'll talk about, has undergone a, a significant challenge recently, is that it binds to this protein called the latent TGF binding protein, which also binds TGF beta and another protein, and sort of sequesters it. So it keeps TGF beta from being active, right? And that the mutation results in release of that, and that TGF beta is then available to work on its receptor and do a series of inflammatory events and things like that that lead to, to aneurysms. And so a nice picture of that is here. So this is the, this is the gene up here, the fibrillin-1 gene. There's a, two proteins here. One is this latent protein and TGF beta, and they sequester it. If you mutate this out and you can't form this complex, then TGF-beta is active, and you turn on these two signaling pathways. One's called the canonical and the other non-canonical pathway. And we can talk a lot about that if you want afterwards, but most of you probably aren't interested in it. A lot of people have focused on this side and used that as an endpoint to try to understand that, and that's probably one of the mistakes in our fundamental biology of because this non-canonical pathway is also very important. And so these two things work together. And as you can see, there's a variety of gene products that eventually are transcribed here, including TGF-beta, other um, uh, proteins uh, that are involved like collagen, uh, things like MMP2 and 9, which are matrix metalloproteinases that break down matrix. Uh, 
So sort of, it's not obvious, like what you see as term potential gene products, that that's good or bad. And that's gonna come back into the story. Um, the TGF beta story is even bigger than this. If you look at sort of this collection of other syndromic ones. So this is sort of a bigger picture of it. And you can see that up here we have what we had before, right, with these, the, our, FIB, our FIB1 mutation and all. But you can see other ones that are popping up here. here. So over on the right, you have the LDS-like syndrome. You have, um, you have Lou's Dietz here with the TGF beta uh, 2 receptor. And so there's multiple places within the signaling pathway that have been implicated in, in the syndromic uh, uh, aneurysms, as well as in some of the uh, familial ones, too. So some of these small familial ones not listed here involve other members of the signaling pathway. So that sounds good, right? So that's a whole story, pretty easy, good idea. <coughs> the, um, but the truth is probably not there, because while some reports show increased TGF beta in aortic tissue from Marfan patients, others do not. So when people ground up tissue from Marfan's patients, they find more TGF beta. So that sort of fits with that, that, that story. But when people look more carefully, they find that free TGF beta probably is not elevated. <coughs> <coughs> but my, mouse, mice that are mutated FIB1 really develop these thoracic aortic aneurysms. People recapitulate it, so that sort of makes sense. But there is some data that show that if you disrupt, so you might predict then, if you disrupted the TGF beta receptor, you would reverse the phenotype, right? So if you took away the effector, then it would get better. But that's not what happens. So here's some, here's some data later from David Dychek's lab out in Seattle. And what he did is he took mice that they made the mice with the Marfan's mutation, and then they crossed them with mice that they knocked out the TGF beta receptor. All right, so if you think that's really because you got free TGF beta, then this would reverse the phenotype. So here's the wild type. These are the Marfan's ones under two different conditions. You just consider them the Marfan's one. And then this is the combined one with the TGF beta receptor. And those animals have larger aneurysms. All right, so that's the exact opposite of what you would predict. So he would suggest that, in fact, there's a protective role going on here of, 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 um, of the signaling pathway. And, and so that's really unresolved. That's really an unresolved issue at this point. And so the questions are, is it really because of the heterogeneity of the disease? Is it because there's some effect not through the TGF beta receptor? Is there some other off-target effect? And it's really not clear what's going on. So that, that's really one of the mysteries. So I know we've all been taught exactly how Marfan works, uh, but it doesn't work that way. It, it's probably more complicated than that. So what about therapy, right? So what is the evidence that supports the use of beta blockers in Marfan? So first of all, beta blocker is not a specific therapy for Marfan's, right? It's, a, it's not a disease-specific therapy. What it is is, you know, the hypothesis was is that the higher dynamic impact of the, each beat of the heart on the vessel wall would make the vessel dilate and have a profound effect, make the aneurysm get bigger. And so if you treat it with beta blockers, you would shrink, you would prevent that progression and delay surgery, <laughs> increase life expectancy. So, um, and, and so, you know, again, not a disease specific, sort of a hemodynamic specific one. And, and so here was the, the study that really, really the basis of the recommendations for us to use beta blockers to treat Marfan patients. And again, we often translate these to non-Marfan patients. Um, and so it was, uh, you know, the combined endpoint, you can see it's a study of, what, 70 patients. Um, probably would not make 2019 criteria for publication in the New England Journal, honestly, right? Um, and a composite endpoint was death, congestive heart failure, aortic regurgitation, aortic dissection, or cardiovascular surgery. Um, and there was a significant difference between being treated with uh, propanolol versus uh, control in those in terms of that combined endpoint. And that, that's the basis, that was the basis. But if you look at the paper carefully, one of the things they look at was the change in aortic uh, diameter. And so they have this aortic ratio here, which is sort of the ratio of the follow-up versus the initial area. And, and so the top is the control group and the bottom is the treatment group. And the article concludes that there appears to be a difference between those two groups, right? <coughs> 
But this is sort of the joy of presenting things on top of each other instead of next to each other. If you present them next to each other, I don't know that those look very different, right? Those look pretty similar. And in fact, there is no statistical difference between the change in aortic diameter. So we give patients beta blockers to try to prevent changes in aortic diameter. And, and really the data, the fundamental data that started this, but that's true with a lot of things. If you think about our original data about mitral stenosis, et cetera, it often comes from small sets of patients. But there's other stuff, right? But again, this is sort of the foundation of it. So other studies, so a lot of, most of it, in fact, all of it is observational. So here are the studies. So 417 subjects to 95, small effect. This was actually a study looking at sort of everything. They looked at surgery, they looked at everything that could predict, you know, what was going on with Marfan. And, you know, small effect, life expectancy 72 versus 70, actually not statistically different, but concluded that in the discussion. In the, discussion. Um, the second one was a positive study with 113 subjects, looked at effect on rate of growth, but it wasn't indexed for size. So you can might imagine larger aneurysms tend to grow at a slower rate. You have this early initial expansion that's been described. And, uh, and then you have another sub, one with 150, decreased rate of dilation, but again, not indexed for size. And then a, a smaller group in pediatrics that showed no effect, and again, probably underpowered for that. And in, you know, here's a summary of, of some other trials put together. And, and you know, this is from a one of those Cochrane database analyses and where they evaluate the quality of the data. And you can see that the quality of the data is uniformly evaluated as low. So while it makes sense, you know, to treat these patients with beta blockers, and we do, and we treat a lot of people with aneurysms with beta blockers, um, you know, the data aren't overwhelming. And, you know, and, and maybe it falls in the common sense category, but there's really not a, not a, not a ton of data. Now, the other subject that always comes up with angiotensin receptors, blockers, and the angiotensin system, and why is that important in, in Marfan and other aneurysmal diseases? So in cells and animal models, ANG2 stimulates TGF-beta expression, all right? So you can take smooth muscle cells, you dump ANG2 on it, they make TGF-beta. <clears throat> and so if you think that's bad, um, ACE inhibitors or ARB should decrease TGF beta expression, and they do in animal models because we have circulating uh, trans, uh, uh, angiotensin II in our bloodstream. And, and also, you know, blood pressure lowering effects could be beneficial. And so the data really were, uh, developed again from the same group, actually, so that initially prenatal treatment with an ARB, which is something none of us would ever do, right? Because of, you know, I mean, that's not, a, that's against the rules, right? Because of the effect on on development of the uh, adrenal system. Uh, but again, in another later on postnatal treatment of these Marfan syndromic mice with Losartan had a positive impact on aneurysm formation. And the, and the data were quite dramatic. So here are these, these little guys, these mice. Again, they have the mutation in them, one of the mutations that uh, for Marfans. And you can see here's a, here's a wild type mouse. And this is a, this is a collagen, a elastin stain ran. And uh, Here's placebo, here's propranolol, and here's losartan after about six weeks in these animals. I think it was about six weeks. And on the right there is the, is the growth. They measured them as they, as they grew. They sacrificed them at different times. And you can see that propranolol had an effect and losartan had a very strong effect. All right. So, so that was very exciting data, and it sort of made sense, right? So if you it fit with the other hypothesis, which we're now a little unsure of, so what about human data? All right, the challenges, right? Beta blockers are accepted therapy. And so a lot of people struggled with the ethics of comparing uh, Losartan or another angiotensin receptor blocker versus no therapy. And so there are uh, sort of a cluster of trials comparing ARBs versus beta blockers. But if you're not sure beta blockers really work, then you're sort of in a little bit of a situation there. But it's also an ethical issue. And there's really a, just a lack of robust clinical data here was an, one of the initial human studies. This was 18 subjects, retrospective, with 65 uh, patients in the control group, which was basically, as best I can understand it, they had about 100 patients in their clinic, and about 18 had been on an ARB, and the rest had not been. And so they sort of divvied them up and looked at what happened uh, with their uh, change in uh, aortic uh, root diameter uh, 
over time. And you can see that, yep, the aortic root uh, looked better after the ARV, but it really wasn't after. Uh, again, this is retrospective, sort of digging through the data. And, uh, you know, the ascending aorta wasn't different, the annulus wasn't different, but the sinotubular junction and the aortic root were different. Um, so again, you know, not really super robust data. And then many of you know that there's, um, you know, a lot of uh, discussion about and probably not a lot of agreement that angiotensin receptor blockers really have a profound effect. So here is one, one the only one I know of that was really a randomized of a beta blocker versus losartan, and they picked a tenolol, or a beta blocker versus an ARV, and they picked a tenolol and losartan did a three-year follow-up, 140 subjects, and you can see by the lines in the middle, the dark lines, so these lines here are the two groups, Tenolol and Losartan, and the other dotted lines that are 95% confidence intervals, and you can see by several measurements of the ascending aorta diameter, root diameter, et cetera, that those, those groups overlap completely and there's no difference. So, <clears throat> so why is there a disconnect? between the laboratory and the clinical data, you know. And so, you know, the real question, right, that always comes up, do the animal models really recapitulate the human disease? Maybe it's just a bunch of mouse doctors, you know, messing around and, you know, it's not really related to the human disease. Always a possibility. Um, Marfan's a really heterogeneous disease. And if you look at sort of uh, one of the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, studies that completed, compared ARB versus beta blocker, there was a predefined subgroup best based on the specific mutation that occurred in the TGF beta system and it seemed to be more effective in one of those mutations. So that might suggest that, you know, the heterogeneity of the disease is important. Um, certainly you could complain a lack of robust clinical trial design, given that there's really only one randomized placebo-controlled trial that was relatively small, you know. We wouldn't change most therapy based on that. And then there's really issues with disease state. Think about a lot of the animal studies. A lot of those are prophylactic therapies where animals are treated prior to induction of the disease or at a very early stage before they've had much development of, of dilatation. And, um, and, and rarely are they treated sort of once they've got reasonably dilated aortas, although some studies have. The other, on the other side, with the human disease, is often the entry criteria. I mean, these are not super common patients, and so patients are entered into these trials with a rather broad baseline phenotype. And while many of the studies tried to go back and, and correct for changes in baseline diameter, that could, really could be a factor, too. You know, you could have people more so advanced that it's sort of too late, right? The horse is out of the barn. You've got some secondary processes underway. And that's very common in biology, right? We see a stimulus initiates a positive pathologic feedback loop, and once things sort of get carried away with all those downstream effects of the TGF beta signaling, be it inflammation or whatever, that, you know, it's, it's just too late. So, now there are a bunch of other things that are mediators of thoracic aortic aneurysms we didn't talk about. Lysol oxidase is a, a family of enzymes, actually. It's not just one. Lysol oxidase and lysol oxidase like proteins, and they're involved in cross linking collagen and elastin, and those are out there. Um, there's a bunch of stuff with matrix metalloprotein, matrix metalloproteinases, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And, uh, and then inflammatory components and in reactive oxygen species. I'm going to talk a little bit about the oxidative stress in thoracic aortic aneurysms because that's sort of what we do when we like oxidative stress and think about that a lot. Um, so here's an animal model, uh, one of the animal models of thoracic aortic aneurysms, and, and what they've measured here, you can see over here, is, um, is uh, isoprostane 8 epipgf 2 alpha which is, a, think of it as a marker of oxidative stress. And as they looked at these animals as they aged, the control and the Marfan model, they saw more production uh, on the left from the tissue and on the right in the serum in these animals as, as they aged. And they also saw dysregulation at the bottom here for those aficionados of, of blots in some of the, uh, uh, the, uh, meet the uh, systems involved in generating and protecting against oxidative stress. But the bottom line, there's a suggestion, and that 
that doesn't necessarily be an exclusion to the TGF beta mechanism because again, downstream from that is a series of inflammatory pathways and it could all be related to that. It's also seen in patients. So these are, uh, these are data taken looking at uh, hydrogen peroxide production, again, a reactive oxygen species in a sense. And hydrogen peroxide is uh, produced normally, but in disease states is often elevated. And what they did is they took sort of the Marfan dilated zone and the non-dilated zone. So as they did an excision of the aorta for the aortic replacement in these patients, and they see more hydrogen peroxide in the dilated zone. Um, unfortunately, right, the, one of the limitations there, so now we have a target. One of the limitations is we don't really have any reasonable antioxidant therapies that work. So we don't, there's not a way to test this effectively in people <laughs> at this point in time. But again, potential pharmacologic target. The others is MMPs, so matrix metalloproteinases. So MMPs, very complex uh, series of uh, proteins, and we'll talk about them more in the context of the abdominal aortic aneurysms. They're involved in breaking down collagen and elastin and other components in the vessel wall. And, and uh, the data is a little mixed, and you know, there's, it's really a sort of a laundry list of ones that are up and ones that are down. And you know, just take it that the data are a little confusing and not entirely consistent. It sort of makes sense if you're remodeling. Anything that remodels the vessel walls involves re uh, regulation of the MMPs. So here's some data from patients with small, medium, and large thoracic aneurysms showing uh, changes in MMP2, one of the MMPs, and showing it's only up in the medium ones. That might make sense. Those are the ones that are growing, uh, and there's more active remodeling underway. Uh, but just, again, an example. And as we'll talk about, people haven't approached that therapeutically in thoracic aneurysms, but this has been a target in abdominal aneurysms. So the last half, I'm going to switch to talk about abdominal aortic aneurysms. And Again, different disease from thoracic. And those of you who weren't here at the beginning, one of the things I started with is, you know, these are, they're both in the aorta, but they're very different diseases. Um, and there's very little overlap in the clinical disease. Risk profiles differ, and the cellular mechanisms have little overlap. So just to remind you, here's epidemiology of AAA. There's a risk factor and relative risk in smoking, family history, age, and things drop off pretty quickly. And uh, you see female sex is protective, uh, uh, black race is protective, hypertension in this study, which was the, one of the VA retrospective studies, it was one of the landmark studies with AAA, actually showed hypertension not to be a significant uh, risk factor. Uh, there is clear association with CAD, as we know. So it's a different profile. The genetics of AAA is really uh, uh, not very revealing at this point, I'd have to say, right? There's really... We went through this, um, you know, whole set of candidate genes that are studied. Many of them studied in animal models, but very little of that is borne out in human tissue. And, uh, if, you know, and there is, you know, this fam familial, you know, linkage, right? I mean, first degree relatives pro um, lead to increased risk, um, but it really doesn't represent the entirety of the disease and, and is not, um, and they tend to be more clusters. You know, the most definitive study was a large GWAS study that included really databases from six countries. They identified 10 genetic loci. They had some interesting SNPs pop out of that. So those are single nucleotide polymorphisms in the IL-6 receptor, L, you know, L LDL receptor, et cetera. Um, but in the worlds of, world of GWAS, these are relatively small uh, data sets. And, and what's really complicating this whole genetics thing is obviously the gene-environment interaction. Right, because smoking, right, that's the number one sort of risk factor. And the overall incidence of AAA is dropping significantly in this country. And why is that? Well, it's probably because the incidence of smoking, right? The prevalence of smoking is dropping very dramatically. Um, so, the, so the genetics are, are not very informative at this point, really at an early stage. In terms of cellular mechanism, we've talked about oxidative stress in the thoracic aorta aneurysms. In abdominal, it's probably a much better studied and more agreed upon uh, mechanism because inflammation plays a very important role. We have to be a little careful about that because a lot of that's based on the animal models. This is, this is some human data I'll show you in a sec. But a lot of our animal models basically induce inflammation. And so it's a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. We have to be careful about that. But these are human data. So these are uh, 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 pieces of aortic tissue 
non-aneurysmal and aneurysmal segments, and they're stained for uh, uh, something called DHE, which is a marker, not a perfect marker, of uh, superoxide or oxidative stress. And so here's a, here's a segment from an individual with a triple A, and here's a, here's a normal one. And you can see a very strong difference with lots and lots of white there, suggesting a lot more superoxide in those animals. You know, our own lab has been studying it. I put in one, one slide from stuff we've done. Well, we've looked at hydrogen peroxide as a radical that's involved in matrix remodeling. And, you know, we have animals that we can either, in this case, we induce by putting calcium chloride on the outside to induce inflammation. You can do this with any of the other models and get similar results. And when we cross that into, into mice, and with time, these animals develop an aneurysm. If you cross that with mice that overexpress catalase, which breaks down hydrogen peroxide, you can prevent that growth in aneurysm. But again, this is disease initiation, and it's also, you know, a bit of an artifactual model, right? I mean, you're putting calcium chloride on the outside to induce inflammation. Here are pictures. That's what a mouse aneurysm looks like, and that's what a normalish looking mouse aorta looks like. And you can see a pretty profound difference, but does it really have uh, relevance to humans? The um, sources of reactive oxybes to AAA are huge, right? So NAPH oxidases, so these are a family of enzymes that are involved in your neutrophils. So when you, you know, eat up bacteria and stuff, these are the enzymes that do that, but they're also present in vascular cells. Nitric oxide synthase, synthase we spelled, yeah, spelled that right, synthase, um, that is, you know, normally makes NO, which is a good, good job, but it becomes uncoupled. Uh, and there's tetrahydrobopterin deficiency and then makes superoxide. And then myeloperoxidase is also thought to be very involved. I'll show you a picture of that. Mitochondria generate ROS, particularly if they're uncoupled. So there's lots of sources. So myeloperoxidase, remember that's in neutrophils, and that takes hydrogen peroxide and generates uh, hypochlorous acid, bleach, right? Clorox bleach, right? So your cells make Clorox bleach, and that can make singlet oxygen. So that's been involved too. And here's, uh, here's some animal work showing uh, APOE mice and then APOE mice that have my myeloperoxidase. This is a heterozygote. This is a homozygote knockout of this animal and showing that you prevent aneurysms in those. So, so there's a lot, there's, you know, it's clearly a lot of animal data. And again, the challenge in converting that to humans then is we don't really have a good drug to test to reduce oxidative stress in humans. So here's all these MMPs uh, out there. So in triple A's, they've been studied a lot more. Um, uh, 1, 2, 3, 9, 12, 13, and 14, uh, just to have the laundry list out there, have been shown to be involved in triple A's. Um, you know, they break down collagen, elastin. They're listed by those. There's a different nomenclature now that's probably a little more appropriate. Um, but they're all very, you know, they cross over, and even though a collagenase will also break down elastin in the right setting and stuff like that. So a lot of them have been implicated. So that, that struck people as a potential therapeutic target because doxycycline, good old doxycycline, is an MMP inhibitor, right? It globally inhibits matrix meloproteinases. And there's been a lot of MMP inhibitors studied in cancer, right? So there's all these candidate drugs out here. So this seemed like a pretty hot area, an area worth pursuing. So here's some animal studies. So this is a, a sham animal. This is an animal that double develops a, a triple A. So, so doxycycline, um, as you can see in the bottom panel there, when you treat them under certain different sort of conditions, either orally or IP, it inhibits aneurysms in mice. So that was pretty exciting. So here's, you know, a drug you could give people, and it should work, right? Prevents matrix metalloproteinases. So human trials have really not borne that out yet, all right? So here is one trial uh, published in 2013, which was a randomized study done pretty well with a reasonable number of patients. And, um, and you can see the doxycycline, this is the estimated mean aneurysmal growth, the growth rate. Um, if anything was trending up, it wasn't significantly different, but was trending to be worse actually in the doxycycline treated group. Uh, there is a large trial underway now, uh, much larger. The criticism of this trial is this was a low dose of doxycycline and in a pilot study they used low, medium, and high dose. And the effect that was the pilot for the subsequent study, the effect wasn't really seen there in the, in the low dose. Um, so there's sort of more to come on this, uh, but so far the data are not overwhelming. Uh, and you could think about that, you know, MMPs are good and bad. 
right? They help you remodel, but they also allow you to remodel to a better mechanical position. They allow you to break down proteins in order to rebuild your extracellular matrix to make you more structurally stable. So it is possible that actually inhibiting them could lead to an adverse outcome. So what about the other thing is angiotensin II, right? So one of the models we use is angiotensin II in mice. So we give mice angiotensin II, put them on a high-fat diet, and those that have a risk for atherosclerosis, either APOE or LDL receptor knockout, those animals, and they develop these really nice aneurysms. You can see a little pretty aneurysm on the left. You open it up, it's all ugly and disgusting inside. But they develop nice little saccular aneurysms. So is ANG2 uh, potentially a target? And, uh, and so ACE inhibitors really don't impact triple-A growth either. One of the problems with a lot of the studies on ANG2, right, is that's an acute intervention. And, you know, it's uh, sort of a, a large uh, dose of inflammation. And those animals, while they have nice little saccular-looking aneurysms, um, some of them develop dissections early on and some other features that are not consistent with human disease. So they, there may be a model issue there. But the human study, and this is a pretty well done study, um, using placebo, they used an uh, ACE inhibitor, and they used amlodipine, and found no difference in over time. Uh, so not, not a positive outcome there. So, so again, there are other things, you know, that have been impl impl implicated. Um, but right now we have this sort of list of over 100, it was like 105 when I last looked at it, different candidates for or, or molecules or reactive intermediates that have been implicated in abdominal aortic aneurysm formation. And while a lot of them work in animals, we haven't translated much of that to humans yet. So that's a real, real challenge. In the last couple minutes, I'm going to just talk about uh, some work we've been doing. I've presented some of this before, but I thought it was sort of fun to follow up. Uh, because, you know, not all factors leading to AAA are druggable targets. And I mean that not only in terms of the mediators we found, right? Some of these are transcription factors and things like that that you really can't drug, right? Because they have such profound effects. But we also like to think about mechanics. So, you know, I like mechanics. And for a lot of time we thought about why aneurysms form where they do. And our hypothesis has been is that there's a flow pattern that sets up why aneurysms form. So in humans, right, triple A's typically form in the infrarenal aorta, and in mice they form in the suprarenal aorta when you give ANG2. So you give a systemic drug, angiotensin II, and they get aneurysms in a different place, but only in that place. So why is that? So without going through a lot of the data, we have a lot of data that suggests that the flow environment, because what happens is if you look in this part of the aorta, uh, in the, it's not showing up, in the suprarenal aorta in a mouse, you see an area of disturbed flow, where flow circulates. And if you look in humans, that's in the infrarenal aorta, uh, at least in males, it's in the infrarenal aorta, and there's a big area of circulating blood flow. And that area of disturbed flow, we think, turns on some key receptors and signaling mechanisms in the endothelium that leads to a cascade of events that predispose you to aneurysms. It doesn't necessarily cause it, but it predisposes you to it. And so we studied this, and one of the neat ways we studied it is look at this difference. Why do women have far less risk for developing a triple A than men? So your answer is estrogen, right? Well, it could be, uh, or androgens. Uh, it could be, but there could be a mechanical reason, and that's because we're all built a little different. So if you look at the blood flow in the pelvis of women, right, it's obviously very different because they have to provide blood flow to the uterus and to the reproductive organ organs. And as much as the men in the audience want to think they have the same amount of blood flow to their reproductive organs as the women do, you do not. You actually have a very small amount of blood flow to your reproductive organs, and women have a whole lot. And in fact, the uterine artery is a very low resistance pathway, and it has no flow reversal. So most of your peripheral blood flow has a flow reversal pattern because there's a pretty high resistance. But the uterine artery has very low resistance, high forward flow, and it's like a sink. It's like a sump, sucking flow out of the aorta. And if you were Dr. Darwin and you were designing the system, that's the way you would design it, right? You wanted to optimize blood flow to the uterus, you know, for babies to grow and to ensure survival of the fetus. So we did an unusual thing. We actually looked at women 
because it all, we looked at a bunch of blood flow studies that had done on the MRI before to look at blood flow <laughs> patterns in the abdominal aorta, and they were actually all done in men. There was not a single published study we could find of blood flow patterns in the abdominal aorta of women. And so when we looked, we found a very big difference. So this is, if you do MRI, you do a phase contrast MR, and look at the blood flow pattern, this is what you see in a male, in blue here. You see forward flow towards the feet going up, and then this triphasic pattern with flow reversal. If you look at women, you see a diminution of that, so you don't see as much flow reversal. Okay? And we hypothesize, that, again, that's because this flow is being sucked off distally into the, into the, through the internal iliacs to the uterus. And so if you look at the blood flow, uh, <clears throat> flow reversal, it's much higher in men, about 15 to 20% of the blood flow going forward comes back every cardiac cycle in that infrarenal aorta, whereas in women it's much lower because it's distally getting pulled away. And if you look then in the internal and external iliacs, you see a very, uh, something that's very interesting. So if you look at the external iliac, right, which feeds the leg, men and women are about the same. Right? They both have the same amount of blood flow reversal, that sort of 18, 15, 20%. But if you look at the internal iliacs, you can see the men have pretty good flood, blood flow reversal, but the women have all, essentially all forward flow. Again, that's all that flow being uh, sort of brought down into the uterus. And then here's just a graphical representation of how that works out. So <clears throat> men on the top, systole on the left there, all forward flow in both men and women. In men, during flow reverse, during diastole, you get flow reversal in the internal iliac, external iliacs, and also the infrarenal aorta. Whereas in women, this flow comes up and then continues to support the uterine blood flow. And then here's some pretty pictures. These are these. This is our colleague Alessandro Vinciani in mathematics developed these. So these are these massless particles. Um, and you can see in male, you can see how the flow comes down, and you can see the flow going backwards, whereas in the women, you can sort of see the blood flow uh, comes up, and it continues to go forward in the internal iliacs. So that was our hypothesis. And we used a couple of, uh, and then Liz Efrick, who was a, uh, one of our residents now, who was an MD-PhD student in the lab, did, did some of this work too, and looked at uh, women that had fibroids. So fibroid tumors are very vascular. So it's even lower resistance. You would expect even lower flow reversal. And so sure enough, that's what she saw. And there's men versus women looking at their ostory flow ratio or the flow reversal. You can see women have less, and then women with fibroids have even less. And uh, that, that's just net flow data. So again, that, that sort of all made sense. So, so clearly, something that might be important in aneurysms and why women don't have as much risk for an aneurysm as men and opens up some interesting discussions about what happens with a hysterectomy at an early age and things like that. Um, but also not a druggable target, right? You can't, you can't pretty much modulate that kind of blood flow in people. So I'll just finish up by just, um, you know, my summary here. And hopefully, if you remember one thing, you know, thoracic and abdominal aortic, aortic aneurysms are very different diseases, right? There's some overlap, but there's a lot of difference, a lot of heterogeneity. And, and there's a lot of heterogeneity in the thoracic aneurysms. Even within Marfan, a thing we think of as a single syndrome, it's a very heterogeneous disease. And really, there are zero, absolutely no disease-specific pharmacologic treatments for aortic aneurysms. Right? We have none defined. And it doesn't mean we shouldn't use you know, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, and ARBs, because they make sense. And a lot of stuff we do, we do because it makes sense, and it might work. Um, and, but there are really some key trials underway. Right? There's another, another trial underway, as I said before, with the uh, MMP inhibitors, uh, the doxycycline in abdominal aneurysms. There are a couple of key thoracic A and Marfan's trials underway as well. And I think we have a lot to learn. And uh, we need to constantly reflect back and forth between these animal models and humans and make sure we're on track and make sure they're, they're relevant. One of the things when we review grants and the things we always think about when people find something in the mouse, you want to make sure you see something correlative in the human so that it makes sense. Uh, there's a, just for the research pe work, some of the people that worked on this, uh, you may see some former fellows there. Alex Malinsky did some of the stuff, Liz Efrick, and Michelle Consolini, Alessandro uh, Veneziani in mathematics, a great collaborator. Um, with that, stop. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks. <laughs>
That was a great talk. Thank you so much. Um, is there a role of statin in aneurysm? Is it thoracic or abdominal? So I, I, I left those data out, you know, there, so there's robust animal data and not much in humans. You know, there, it's been most extensively studied in abdominal aneurysms. And if you use a composite endpoint of death MI, aneurysm rupture and all that stuff, you get positive results. If you look specifically at aneurysmal dilatation, those results are net, not positive. So, and again, is that because it's just too late? You know, you sort of the horse is out of the barn again. Who knows? But, uh, but uh, there's similar data actually with uh, platelet antagonists, as you might imagine, because the data show in AAA that if you have a thrombus, you have a higher rate of, of dilatation with time. And so people have studied antiplatelet agents in those individuals. And while well, if you look at a lumped endpoint with cardiovascular endpoints, yes, you get a positive outcome. But if you look specifically at aneurysmal dilatation, you don't see, a, don't see any change. So, uh, Bob, really nice talk. And, um, you know, there, there are obviously a lot of correlates between the aortic work and the coronary work. And, you know, the punchline with the biomechanics is... But this vessel's bigger. <laughs> right, it's a lot bigger. <laughs> but um, the punchline is that while, you know, there, there may be some mechanistic sort of insights you get in terms of tying in the vascular biology to the disease phenotype, somehow, um, you know, when it comes to therapies or altering those biomechanics, it's, we always run into trouble, right? It's kind of hard to do. And I just wonder what your thoughts are on the effect of, you know, things like posture and exercise, particularly in the lower extremity. I know you've done that cool work with the amputation, but what about exercise? Uh, because what, what would the impact of exercise be on the, on the lower extremity resistance? And would that be at least some potential therapeutic target that we know generally helps but could tie into the abdominal aortic aneurysm story. Yeah, so so it sort of makes sense, doesn't it? If you exercise, you increase your muscle mass, probably increase your vascular network. And uh, a guy named Charlie Taylor, no relation, out of Stanford, who you know from, uh, he's now in the commercial world, um, had a series of studies in which he took people with triple A's and exercised them and uh, really didn't see any significant change. Those were all pretty acute experiments, though, and people with established um, AAAs. You know, probably makes sense. The concern, obviously, then the issues he ran into with IRBs and stuff is, well, your blood pressure goes up. Does that increase your risk of acute rupture in these patients? Um, so the studies he did were largely sort of acute monitored experiments with someone in an MRI scanner, you know, on a bicycle and things like that. So it, it certainly makes sense. I can tell you sort of anecdotally, uh, you, know, you mentioned the amputee work. Uh, for others in the room, we've done studies looking at what the effect is of occluding blood flow to the leg because there's these data. It's just patients with above the knee amputation increase risk for AAA, and it's sort of the opposite of being female because you have much higher resistance, much higher flow reversal. And, uh, and you know, it's sort of it all pans out, but one of the subjects we looked at uh, who had an amputation actually had very low flow reversal, but this was also a guy who could hike to Stone Mount, top of Stone Mountain on a crutch on one leg. Um, and he, his, his good leg was a larger than many people's waist. I mean, it was a massive amount of muscle mass there, and you know, he had very little flow reversal. So I guess if, if you could do what he does, which is on one leg go and a crutch, climb up and down Stone Mountain, uh, you, could, you could impact it. I just comment on the, the really marked differences in the phenotype of the uh, mice, mouse model and the humans, right, that, the, that you pointed out when you showed your data. I noticed that the aneurysms were suprarenal. Mm -hmm. um, and that must really put a wrench in that model altogether, right? I mean, I, I know there are things you could probably learn from it, but. Well, I think, I think it's the flow pattern, though, right? I mean, that's the difference, right, is the flow reversal is in the humans is infrarenal, and in mice it's suprarenal, and that's sort of the big difference. And um, we have some data that suggest that the H2 receptor expression is different and influenced by that flow environment. Um, you know, the other models are you put on external elas uh, internal elastase and hyperpressurize the vessel, sort of overextend it. The others you put calcium chloride on top, 
you know, none, none of those models are perfect, and uh, you end up using several of them usually. Dr. Smith. Bob, Bob, who do you screen for abdominal aortic aneurysms, and uh, what do you think about the uh, the guidelines on, on screen? So, the, you know, the guidelines, and we all know what the guidelines are, and it's, you know, the welcome to Medicare thing, and, and if you're a male and smoker and family history, what's excluded from the guidelines essentially are largely women, and, uh, you know, that's probably not appropriate. And that, and is there, I don't know, Rebecca could probably tell me the difference between there's a European guideline, there's a U.S. guideline, there's a vascular surgery guideline, and I'm always going to mix up about which is which, and one of them lets you screen women and one doesn't let you screen women. And uh, I know I've battled with insurance companies over screening women, um, but uh, I, th I think the guidelines are probably, you know, I mean, until we know better, they'll stay where they are, but right now they're probably a little, uh, a little limited. Yeah, Tam there. So over the years in practice, I've seen people who with ARB and beta blockers have maintained dimensions of 4.2 or so, and in the next years, some of them have just galloped away to larger and larger sizes, and despite best therapy. So can you hypothesize on the differences in these two categories as to why I want to go more rapidly despite best therapy and when and not? No, I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, you know, they, you know, the question is, is are those therapies doing anything, right? I mean, that's the question. Are those therapies um, really effective? I mean, it's what we do, but are they really having an impact? And the natural history of all these aneurysms is not of linear growth, right? It's of exponential growth and nonlinear process. Um, so, you know, that, that's more consistent with just the natural history of aneurysmal dilatation. And that's one of the problems when you go back and look at the Marfan data where they do these rate of changes because it's a, it's a nonlinear function. One last one. <laughs> so have we looked at women with hysterectomy? We've just done a few, and we haven't done enough to really... There, there appears to be a little different. Some, there is a difference. I can show you some of the data, but we've only done like four or five. Um, we're waiting for the NIH to think this is interesting enough to fund because uh, it gets a little expensive doing all these MR scans. Uh, but that's, that's something we really want to do. And we also want to do uh, the women with fibroids after uh, embolization therapy because, as you know, that's the, one of the more common ways of treating fibroids now with embolization. And that should make them go back up in their oscillations. So, all right. Well, thanks so much, everyone. Have a good day. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.